to explain to you what CARD is and what CARD does. Specifically, what CARD might be able to do for you or someone you know, someone in your family, your next door neighbor, anyone that you can think of who can benefit from our services. Part of our job at CARD is to try to identify those who qualify for our services and make, make them aware of what it is that we can do to support them. So that's the first part of what I'm going to be sharing today. The second part of what I'll share today is just kind of some background into autism. I'm trying to get a basic understanding of what we understand as a science about autism and what we still don't understand. Um, and then some of the common questions that we often get asked when we work with people on the spectrum. Um, I would love for this to be as informal as possible. So if there are questions that pop up um, that are relevant to what we're talking about, you're welcome to ask them now, as well as wait and save them till the end. I know there's gonna be some Q and A time at the end. So if that's your preference, doesn't bother me. I'm happy to field questions as we go along. Up and down. Do I turn it on? No, nope, you clicked the side buttons. It did. It may work for the other one. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. Okay. No phone. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's this one. Oh, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So CARD stands for the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. Um, Florida is the only state that has something called this, although we often get confused with similar names. So we are often referred to just as CARD, but our full name includes related disabilities. And I'll talk in a minute about what that means and why we include that term. Um, there are seven centers across the state of Florida. So we have 67 counties in our state, and every county is assigned to one of our seven CARD centers. We are all funded from the same source, and that is the State Department of Education. Hi, welcome. Um, we serve at our card center, we serve 14 counties, but it is not uncommon for us to receive a phone call from someone else asking for help. And we ask them what county they reside in, and they reside in a different county, and then we can very easily direct them to the correct card for their county. We are funded on a yearly basis, um, and every year the funds are basically distributed based on the number of constituents or clients, patients, et cetera, that we have in our particular region. Our region, I'll share with you in a minute, serves um, Alachua County, Marion County, all the way down to the Hernando kind of end down there, Hernando and Citrus, all the way up to Hamilton and Swanee up at the top. The, one of my favorite things to share about CARD is that all of our services are free of charge. So everything that we do, regardless of the person, the individual, or even the agency um, or community organization that we serve, all of the things that we do are free which is my favorite, one of my favorite things about working for CARD. So as I said, related disability means something specific. Sorry, feedback. I won't talk quite that loud, I guess. <laughs> um, first and foremost, we serve people of any age, any age at all. So I think right now our youngest kiddo is one and our oldest is in their 60s, their late 60s. So you do not age out of our services, which is another great thing because so many other services do have an aging out component. Ours does not. However, because our funding comes from a particular source, we, are, um, we have specific rules about who it is we do serve. So we serve anybody with an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. Um, if they have a diagnosis from you know, 2009, and it says something like Asperger's syndrome, a term that's no longer used in our diagnostic criteria anymore, those people are still grandfathered in. Hello. So anyone who is under that general global label of autism spectrum disorder. We also, as a related disability, serve people with developmental disability label. Um, you may or may not know that until recently, that was something that you could have the diagnosis until you turn six years old. Now you can have that diagnosis until you turn nine years of old, you're nine years of age. So what we try to do is incorporate anybody into the services that we can get under that label. When they turn nine, one of two things will happen. Three things, I guess. They'll either get it off of the diagnosis, they'll get some other kind of diagnosis, or they will have been relieved of any sort of diagnosis because they kind of caught up. Developmental disability by definition is kind of like, you're just not quite on par with where your same age peers are, but we're gonna get you there. So if you're not there by the time you're nine, then and you get an autism label, we can continue to serve you under that label. The related disabilities part um, is something that people often forget, um, mostly because sometimes people call us Center for Autism. And although that's a lot of what we do, we also serve these other conditions. 
So first is dual sensory impairment. That means an individual of any age who has both a hearing and a vision impairment together. Doesn't mean they have to com be completely legally deaf or legally blind, can or, but they do have to have both of those impairments to qualify for our services. The other way you can qualify is having a hearing impairment with another disabling condition or a vision impairment with another disabling condition. So for example, if you have a vision impairment and you have a cognitive impairment, for example, that would qualify you for our services as well. And I always tell people, this sounds very confusing, even though I try to make it sound simple. So if you don't know, call us and we'll tell us, we'll tell you if you can qualify for our services. If for some reason you cannot, and you can't make that work, we will help you find other agencies that can support you. Ask a question. Please do. Yes. Certain disabilities do not have not, will not be diagnosed as ASD or the DDD. Like somebody who's in a marginally disabled, like dyslexia, and things like DNOS, would they still be considered to service as some of this car? So PDD-NOS is a term that used to be under the umbrella of autism before, 2000, before 2013, when they changed the diagnostic criteria. If you come to me and you say, I have a PDD-NOS diagnosis, you will be allowed to benefit from our services. But that is not a label we will, have, we will be encountering for future clients that right. come down the line. Things like a learning disability, however, would not, a learning disability by itself would not qualify for our services. Like if somebody has dyslexia, they wouldn't. That's right. And so what we would do in that instance is try to direct you towards other services that provide support to that sort of community. You. No, you're welcome. Another question. Yeah, um, sort of in a similar vein, um, if I have family members who years ago were diagnosed as slow learning disabled, right? Is sort of the all encompassing term that could yeah. include autism, that could include any number of things, but there wasn't exactly a specific diagnostic criteria at the time. Would they then need to be um, undergo like an official evaluation for autism to partake in your services, or would they be able to just sort of like meet with you, discuss, do a consult? So we do ask that the person that takes advantage of our services does have a diagnosis. And please keep in mind that it is not uncommon at all for people, young adults and older adults, to come seeking an autism diagnosis in their adulthood. And it, and it often is because they come and they say, you know, I was diagnosed with, you know, fill in the blank when I was a kid, but I don't feel like that's the best description of my experience. I would like to be evaluated for autism. And in many cases, it is in fact true that the diagnosis that was used is maybe not the best description and, and um, understanding of that person's needs as opposed to an autism label. So that's always something that a person can do. It is very common for a person with autism to have a dual diagnosis, so more than one diagnostic condition. Um, and so when that happens, we often see maybe a child with a learning disability who also then has autism. When we talk about autism and its components, um, I think you'll see how it does differ quite a bit from a traditional learning disability. There are components of it that have to be present in order for you to rule out learning disability and rule in developmental disability like autism. Yes. Sorry for No, it's okay. No, no, no. So an incoming freshman, for instance, when they were a freshman, if they had a diagnosis of ADD or ADHD earlier, they could come and ask for a diagnosis of a spectrum. Yeah, diagnosis. a person of any age can see a diagnosis. Yes. And it may, it may, you may make the, the the result of that evaluation may be actually autism is a better description of you, or it may be. You have autism and you also have ADHD, right? So it can be one and the other or one or the other. But yes, we, it's very common for, for young adults and adults to see the diagnosis as well, Thank you. of course. So here are our seven card centers. You'll notice they're all based out of a state university. Um, the funds come from the State Department of Education to that university and then disseminated to the card center. Our card center happens to be based out of the College of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. Some of the other card centers are based out of communication sciences or education, et cetera. But we all, regardless of where we're based, we all provide the same services. We are all um, required to provide them. So here's what it looks like in a graphic form. Our card center is the one in red. You can see that some areas have a small number of counties, but they also serve a lot of people. As you might imagine, New York, University of Miami only has three counties, but they have a lot of people and they're helping down there because the population density is just, is just bigger. 
So that's kind of the area that we serve right there. These are the counties that we serve. These are our 14. If you don't see your county up here, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of us and say, can you help me find my card? That's something that we do all the time. It's also one of the features of our website as well, just to be able to make sure that everybody is aware of our services and then gets hooked up with the right card center. Your card center is based on your home address. So even if your child goes to a school elsewhere, um, outside of your district or outside of your zip code, they all is based on your home address. Okay, so what does CAR do? We do a number of things. The first is training. So for the most part, our trainings are by request, like this today, right? So someone, anyone really, who has an interest in learning about more about autism and related disabilities can, can approach us and say, we would like a training on this. We've trained schools and hospitals, we've trained grandparent groups, we've trained foster parent groups, we do a lot with police and um, DCF, we do a lot with first responders and so forth, right? So anyone who knows that they're going to encounter this population, which is pretty much everyone, um, and who seeks to learn more about how to be a better communicator with a person with autism, perhaps, um, will seek out our training. We have a list of training topics that are pretty common. But if you come to us with a different topic, we will do our best to try to meet that need. We offer them in person, we offer them via Zoom, we offer them synchronously, we even offer them asynchronously. So on our website, there are um, capsulated trainings that you can go in in your own time in your pajamas and, and listen to them. Um, and they give a lot of this basic information about some of the things we're gonna talk about in general today. And we often offer continuing education credits. Um, we have a conference once a year, um, but most of our trainings are single trainings that happen across our 14 county region. But if you, as, a, as an interested party, want to attend any of those trainings, you can. The trainings are open to anyone. The next thing we do is called technical assistance. This means primarily support to schools and school districts. So the school can reach out to us and say, we're struggling to support this child. Can you please come in and help us? And we will do observations, we'll give recommendations, we'll make visual supports and other tools that may help the child. We can attend meetings on, on behalf of the child and so forth. Conversely, the parent can also contact us and say, my child is struggling in school. Can you please go to the school and give them some support? The only caveat is that both parties have to agree. We don't typically have trouble with this. So if mom and dad are asking for the observation, the school has to say, it's okay for us to come. And vice versa, if the school is asking for the observation, mom and dad have to say, it's okay for you to come. So it's typically classroom observations with recommendations and follow-up. We also do things like help with IEPs or individual education plans, Bible fours, and behavior plans. Um, really anything that supports the child, even if it's the kid's great in school, but he has trouble when we go on a field trip. Well, then we can go on the field trip with you and kind of figure out how to better support that child. Or they do great with academics, but not so great with the social stuff. Can you come give us some tips for how to make their social experience better in school? Those would be some examples. We also have a program called PEPSA Partnership, which is available to anyone who works within the school system. It could be a teacher, but it could be another professional as well who wants to learn more about autism and they do, they partner with a card staff member and they work together on, a, on an autism specific project. It might be developing a curriculum for um, the whole class. It might be visuals for one student. It could be anything that supports their learning around autism and their students that they serve. The next thing we do is called individual assistance. This is support to the individual with autism, child or adult in their home or community. So we will do home visits. Um, if a child is unsafe or is demonstrating challenging behavior, we can come out and give some strategies about that. Uh, if the family needs some help supporting that person's language and communication, or even homework and chores, or self-care skills like showering and dressing and making meals and all of those things. In adulthood, we also help people with employment, um, trying to find um, employment that's appropriate to them, trying to find as independent living as they can possibly um, have. We do that through our staff. We also do that through partnerships with other organizations that provide similar services. So it, it, it tends to involve things again, like observation, but then we do some coaching with the adults. So you may notice that we're not directly working with these individuals. We're working with the people around them, whoever that might be. It might be your, your Sunday school teacher. It might be your karate instructor. It might be your dad. It could be anybody who is part of your life that you want to that person wants to be able to support. So things like behavior, communication, 
self-care and independence, social skills, employment, pretty much anything. People on the autism spectrum tend to have some difficulties sometimes with safety. So they may wander or run away. They may seek out water sources. So we also work with families to make sure their house is safe. Um, make sure they're connected with their um, police department in case something were to happen, all of those things. Resource referral. This means that if you have a child or an adult, um, or you are a child or an adult, you can contact us and say, um, my doctor recommended that I get some speech therapy. Can you tell me where I should go for that? We don't give recommendations per se. What we say is, here are the list of providers and here are their contact information, right? And then you have to take it upon yourself to call, find out if they accept your insurance, if they're a waiting list, all of those things, right? So what we can do is provide the list. So you tell me what county you live in, and I can send you a list of even things like pediatricians who have experience with autism, or um, I need my daughter needs her hair cut, but she doesn't want to get her hair cut. Do you know somebody who works with kids with autism that's getting their hair cut? So we do our best to try to make all the community resources known. We have a lending library, which consists mostly of books although it also consists of some other types of resources too. And then we have a visual supports lab. So one of the things we know about people with autism is that they tend to be very visual learners. And so um, one of the things that we do in our office is create individualized visuals for that person. It might be around positive behavior. It might be around independence or not forgetting my stuff at school every day or remembering the steps of washing my hands. It can be any number of things. But these with all with the intention of making a person more independent. Again, all of those are free as well. And then public education. Our job in public education is just to make sure that we are present in all 14 of the counties that we serve, and we are making sure that they are aware of CARD and autism, really. Over the years, I've learned fewer, fewer and fewer people are not aware of autism, but we certainly want them to be aware of autism and aware of CARD and what CARD can do. Our staff members include a variety of people. We have special educators, speech pathologists, psychologists, behavior analysts. So we all come from a different background, but we all kind of, and so we all approach the cases slightly differently, but the perception is the goal is independence, positive quality of life, um, you know, making those people be able to access the things that they need to be successful and happy. So I might do that a little differently from my colleague, but we all have the same kind of goals in mind. We also have parent partners. A parent partner is a person who is the, the parent of a child with autism, who has been through a lot of these things before and can help walk a family through some of those things. What comes to mind are things like applying for SSI and applying for Medicaid and applying for um, housing services or applying, you know, that sorts of things. Or when we get to the age where it's like, am I gonna make the decisions for this child? Do I, do I you know, what sort of legal documentation do I need to work on? That could be a very overwhelming world um, if you're not familiar with it. So that's a lot of what our parent partners do. They also help us run our support groups, which is another thing we do, um, as well as do a lot of our tabling events in the community. So it's often our parent partners that will do those tabling events. We have a number of support groups. We have support groups in person and via Zoom. We have support groups for parents and other caregivers and loved ones. We have support groups for adults with autism. We have a separate support group for women with autism. Um, we occasionally try to get off the ground. One of my favorite things, which are called SIV shops, which are support groups for siblings of kids with autism. So we really try to you know, emphasize that we're not just working with an individual, we're, we're working with a family, a group of people who need our support. We have a conference every year. We have a, a card conference every year in January. We also have a U.S. card conference once a year as well. We do something called employment boot camp every year, which is a year, a year long. <laughs> I wish it was. It's a, it's a week long intensive training about how to find, get, and most importantly, keep a job. Um, we have something called autism in the arts, which is an event that we hold every year to celebrate the artistic and the performance talents of people on in our constituency, um, children and adults. And then we also have social learning groups. So those are um, dedicated meetups of kids of certain ages. We have different groups for different ages and they practice socializing with each other while they play games, while they play sports. They practice things that are hard for them like having a conversation or staying on topic or telling somebody that their hair looks ugly without being rude, you know, those kinds of things. That's 
Well, that's, that's a lot of what we, we deal with in those social learning groups. We are not allowed to fundraise for ourselves, but we, we have many agencies and groups in the community that are kind enough to do fundraisers on our behalf. So the most common or not the most, probably the most popular one is called Stomp the Swamp. It actually happens at the stadium every year and people actually pay, blows my mind, but people actually pay for the privilege of running up and down the stadium steps for fun. <laughs> they pay money to do this. <laughs> and so the money goes towards cars. And then we use that for things like visual support slab or um, the lending library books and, and things that go directly back to our constituents. We've had groups do painting with a twist with us. We have a group that does a paddle race every year. Um, we've had groups that we, this was a star, star 5K is a high school group that did a 5K for us for a number of years. And so, you know, basically people reach out to us and say, I'd like to help, how can you help? And we say, this is a great way to help because <laughs> we can't do these for ourselves, but we sure appreciate the efforts of others in that way. All right, so that was my very brief overview of what, card can do for you or someone that you know. Any questions on that before we shift gears a little bit? Yes, I would just say this was really interesting because I just bought a house with, they had a child that was autistic. Really? And like all of the rooms were color coded and the doorknobs were different on each door so that they could tell them which door. Wow. And the, the crystal doorknob and the, they had deadbolts on all the, on yes. the external doors. And, and so they were explaining why they had the house that way. And I, I probably, um, if I had flipped this and gone to this presentation first, it would have been more understandable to me. But it was really interesting for them to, have done all those steps and, and prepared the house that way. You know, it's really for that family. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. I would love to hope that you know, card or, or someone else, maybe their school or other agency, kind of was able to provide some of those ideas to them. The parents are the best. They always come up with the greatest solutions. I always, I always like steal stuff from parents. I'm stealing that. That's a great <laughs> idea. You know? um, so parents do what they have to do. You know, they do some really creative things to make sure their kid is safe and happy and successful in their house. That's really cool. I'm leaving a lot of this stuff. I know, right? <laughs> Welcome to my crystal room. <laughs> There's a story in there. Sometimes you have a story. I love that. Love that. All right, we'll continue, but as I said, if you think of things related to card or ASD, please feel free to ask. There's a comment or a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. we'll do um, Q&As at the end. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. All right, thank you for that. So autism spectrum disorder is often shortened to the term autism, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as ASD. Um, ASD is a lifelong neurological and developmental disability. That means that it is something that you're born with and you have it for your life. At this point, there's no cure for autism. It's neurological, meaning that it has to do with both the structure and function of the brain. And it's developmental, meaning that, as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about developmental disability, what we're saying is not that the child can't learn, but they're learning on a slightly different trajectory than another person. So in fact, that might mean, we tend to think about that as they learn slower than everybody else, but that is not actually the case. Sometimes they learn skills faster than the average Joe, sometimes slower than the average Joe, and sometimes just about the same. So their, you know, their pattern of development is, is unpredictable. And so one of our jobs as educators is to fill in those gaps, right? So that they can meet all of their academic needs, their academic needs being certainly important. But what the most important thing is around autism is that autism is truly a social disorder. So you can have a person with autism. In fact, two thirds of people with autism don't have any sort of cognitive impairment at all. They're either smarter than you or as smart as you and me. Right? Only one third have any sort of cognitive delay of any kind. But what they all have in common is they all have a social disorder. And that is how we define autism. <clears throat> so I like to share this picture because I think it's a really great image. So if you were described, to describe the brain on the left, that is a typically developing child, what kind of words would you use to describe that brain? Just it's pretty busy, yeah. right? It's pretty busy. And we know that about kids, right? They're learning all the time. That's when we learn foreign language the fastest and all that stuff because we have so much going on in our brain. But if this is a busy brain, what's that? Brain on steroids. There you go. <laughs> That's an overwhelmed brain, right? Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard people use the term um, overwhelmed or overstimulated yes. or chaotic or those sorts of terms. And, and, and truly, that is the experience of a lot of people with autism. Keep in mind that I'm going to be using all of these statements as generalities. Not everyone has the same experience, certainly. Um, but just this, this picture is, is so important to me because I will often, once I share this picture with people, I will often refer to that blue brain. 
And that helps us remember, like, we are in a place that is very overwhelming. Everything about what we're hearing and seeing and smelling and tasting and all of those things are, are entering our brain at the same time. And it's very hard as a person with autism to sort of piece apart, all right, what am I supposed to be paying attention to right now? And so that often leads to some of the challenges that we see with autism. So autism has been increasing for a while. I'm sure you hear often of the numbers. I started doing this in 1996. Nobody knew what autism was. They were like, oh, that's cute. Does that mean they're good at drawing? I'm like, no. <laughs> No, not artistic, right? So people didn't really know, right? Now, when I tell people what I do for a living, nobody says, oh, really, what's autism? Everybody has some sort of understanding, even if it's basic one or even if because they watch The Good Doctor on TV, right? Somebody somewhere has, you know, has put autism in front of you for some reason. But there are, are actual reasons why the numbers are increasing. Number one, because we have better awareness and better awareness leads to better testing, assessment, and in, in 2013, it actually led to a change in, in the diagnostic criteria. So the actual language that is used to diagnose somebody with autism has been made different and, and broader, I would say. So when you make diagnostic criteria broader, more people fall into it, right? And so then you have higher numbers. And that's essentially what happened. Also, in the olden days, pediatricians, if at best, got one day on autism in all of their pediatrics training. And people started to realize that's not going to cut it. We have way too many of these kids. We need to know more than that, especially since pediatricians are often the first line of defense. When you think something's wrong with your kid, where do you go? You don't go to your mailman. Yeah, you go to your doctor, right? And so if they don't have some basic understanding of autism, they're not going to guide you in the way that you might need. So we've had better training for pediatricians. We also know that early intervention is kind of a big deal. It's really important. It doesn't mean that a 12-year-old can't learn stuff anymore or a 35-year-old by any means, but it does mean that we know that when kids are little, we have that window of opportunity to really pump them full of skills when they're younger. It gets a little harder when they get a little older. And so because we know that early intervention is so important, parents are now pushing for earlier diagnosis so that they can get access to the stuff that helps their kid. I would do. Mm -hmm. Here's also what we know. Autism has nothing to do with whether or not your mom and dad gave you hugs and kisses when you were growing up. I know that sounds weird to hear, but that was a theory back in the olden days that the reason that people became autistic, you don't become autistic by the way, but the reason people became autistic is because their mom and dad were not, you know, were not affectionate enough with them. And I mean, first of all, that's completely inaccurate. Second of all, how horribly hurtful to parents to hear that kind of thing. So that is absolutely not the case. What also is not the case is it's not exposure to some sort of out, outside influence, okay? Now, anybody's diagnostic description can be influenced by their, in their environment, right? But this does not lead to autism, that's the difference. And then controversially, um, vaccines do not lead to autism. I could talk about that for a very long time, but just suffice it to say that there's only been one study to show a connection between vaccines and autism. Most people have heard about that, but what they haven't heard about is that several years later, most of the doctors who were on that study announced that they had kind of made it all up. They've been paid by the, you know, the drug companies and they all apologized. They all had their medical licenses taken away, but some people don't hear about that part of the story. So there is no evidence, there is no connection, and the whole world's been trying to find one because obviously everybody gives vaccine. One of the reasons we know it's not vaccines is because we as the United States give more vaccines than any other country in the world. And yet our rates of autism are similar to countries that don't give any vaccines at all. So that's just one reason that we know that there's not a connection there. What we do know is that autism is genetic. It's considered a polygenetic disorder. There are about 400 genes associated with autism, which is why we can't just do a blood test to figure it out because we haven't identified all those genes yet. You know how there's some conditions where there's one gene? It's like, oh, we found the gene for something, right? We're good to go now. Well, that's not really going to be the case for autism. We've got a lot of work to do there. But there are many, many really great researchers around the world who are looking at this very closely. Um, but it's not just going to be one thing. So what I really want to do with my remaining time is just kind of talk about how do we get to an autism diagnosis. If you are someone who thinks you or someone you know might have this diagnosis, here are the things that they're going to be looking for when they evaluate you. First, you have to have the purple circle and the green circle. You can't have one or the other. Okay. If you just have the purple circle, meaning only social and communication challenges, you probably have a language disorder, okay? maybe social anxiety, maybe. right? If you only have the green circle, which talks about behavior, you probably have a behavior disorder, maybe OCD, maybe. Right? 
You have to have both of these things in order to qualify for an autism diagnosis. They all also have to be present for early childhood. So if you at 44 years old get yourself an autism diagnosis, they're going to be asking you about your early childhood. Because if these characteristics didn't appear until you were older, it is not autism. It is something else. It is something similar, but not autism. It has to have been there from childhood, even if it wasn't defined or identified in childhood. And then secondly, it has to limit and impair functioning. So sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm a little autistic too. I don't like crowds. And it's like, well, no, not really. That's not how it works. But, but yes, we all can relate to some of that social experience. We all have things that we are uncomfortable with, particularly socially. But in, in order to have this diagnosis, it has to impair your life, right? Like you can't do things that would make it successful for you to go to the grocery store and buy your groceries or get some books from the library or have a job or have a meaningful relationship, right? That's what we mean by impairing everyday functioning. So the first category, that, that purple circle, is social and communication interactions. So the first is social emotional reciprocity. People with autism have a hard time being reciprocal meaning that they don't understand that when someone approaches them, that's a bid for an interaction and I'm supposed to do something back, right? Or if somebody says, hey, how's your day? You probably don't have to rack your brain to figure out how to respond to that question, right? You can at least say, good, how about you, right? Something like that. People with autism often have a hard time with the reciprocal component of interaction. They also have a hard time with both verbal and nonverbal communication. So we all know that we use a lot of nonverbal communication when we're interacting with people. Um, people with autism can have trouble with using body language and facial expressions and gestures, and also understanding the body language, facial expressions, and gestures of other people. So if you and I are talking and you're going like this, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you're looking at your watch over and over, eventually I'm going to figure out that you're like, you got to go, you can't have this conversation anymore. Or if I'm looking over my shoulder all the time when you're talking to me, that's nonverbal communication that I'm distracted by something, right? People with autism have a hard time with that. They also have a hard time understanding how to use those kinds of um, interactions appropriately. And then there are two forms of language, expressive and receptive. Expressive is the language you produce, and expressive is the language you understand. And people with autism often have very different levels of those two things. So it's very common for a person to have lots of expressive language and not very good receptive or listening skills or the other way around. And so it can be very deceiving because you can have a very chatty person with autism and say, oh, they're fine. They, they've got lots of language. That doesn't mean they're understanding or using their language appropriately. It doesn't mean that they can anticipate how to an exchange just because they have a lot of words inside their brain. It's not the same. Next is developing and maintaining relationships. So the point, point I want to make here is that it is almost never the case that a person with autism doesn't want to have relationships. It's that they don't have the skills, right? So I might want to learn how to speak Japanese, but I don't have the skills. So I'm not going to be very good at it unless I make some direct effort to learn that new skill. And that is the case for social skills with people with autism. They can learn how to be social with friends, with adults, with supervisors, with whoever but they have to learn it in a more direct way than just through observing what everybody else does to be social. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna go to this next part now. So this, the B, the green circle, is restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. That's a very long name. It just means behavior, things that we're observing. So the first is stereotype movement or repetitive movement. You might see this in typical ways, um, like toe walking, hand flapping, humming, rocking your body, looking at your fingers, those sorts of things. Those are called stereotypes. They serve a function. Typically, that function is anxiety reduction. Um, and because autism is primarily a social and communication disorder, people with autism tend to have pretty high rates of anxiety, right? Which would make sense. If you can't communicate and you don't, you're not going to be able to ask the questions that make your life easier and better to understand, you're going to have a level of anxiety just at your baseline that other people don't have. So we may see both repetitive motor movements and also use of speech. So you may hear kids who like to say the same phrase over and over, or they like to um, calm themselves down by saying all the lyrics from a song or all the words from a movie. Again, all this stuff's functional and we try to treat it that way. We have to respect, respectfully treat it that way, but that is a characteristic of autism. The second one is not being a very flexible person. Now, again, I say most human beings aren't very flexible, but this is to an extreme, right? So getting very distressed by a change in routine, getting very distressed by surprise, 
getting very distressed when something was supposed to happen and something else happened instead, or we're taking a different road home, or I thought we were going to McDonald's first, but mom's pulling into the bank. Why is this happening? You know, those sorts of um, features of distress. And then the last is highly, not the last, the second to last is highly restricted and fixated interest. Um, this is what we refer to when we say that people with autism have kind of like a passion area. They tend to, not everyone, but they can learn a lot about a certain thing and be very passionate about it and not realize that after they've gone on for 45 minutes about it, everybody else probably wants to talk about something else, but I still want to talk about my favorite topic, right? It's great to have that passion. We try to direct that passion into employability and other things. Um, even like if you have to write an essay, well, let's write the essay on your favorite topic, right? But it can be detrimental for relationships because not everybody wants to talk about air conditioning units for more than five minutes or so. And then lastly, hyper and hypo reactivity to the environment. So this is what we talked about earlier. Think about the blue brain, right? Feeling very overwhelmed by the environment. So little, little noises and big noises sound just as loud. Little smells and big smells smell just as smelly. Um, the clothes that I'm wearing, the lights that are making clicking noises that nobody else can hear. All of those things combined, think about how overwhelming that would be if your life was this inundation of sensations all the time and you're supposed to be listening to the teacher or listening to your, you know, listening to your karate instructor or looking at your homework. You know, it's very hard to be able to piece aside all of those things and figure out what to focus on. So that can be an area of challenge um, for people with autism. All right, I'm going to stop now. We have our second speaker, and then we have our questions. Yes, perfect. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to our next speaker. Oh, pardon me, I have to leave. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thanks for coming. Let me turn this off first with her before she puts it on again. Okay. If you have any questions, um, make sure you stay in the chat. Also, we will have a raffle. I'll announce raffle winners at the end of Q and A. So we'll have three raffle winners. Oh yeah, you're probably here. <laughs> I already did it through um, whoever is present, and then I put it in a raffle, and then it picks three winners. So we have our raffle winners. Just stay tuned. We got some good items. Um, if my zoom go. And then if you guys on Zoom don't mind, can you please put any questions you have in the chat? Um, that way, as soon as uh, our next presenter finishes, we can lead them start on Q&As. Did you press your mic? Okay, ready for our next presentation? Only one thing. Hi, y'all. That was a, this is going to be a hard presentation to follow because that was so much information. So I'm going to get a little bit more specific. My name is Andrea Jasper. I am a pediatric speech and language pathologist. And I know our card folks touched on speech and language pathology services just a little bit briefly. I know that they also talk a lot about communication. And so I'm going to get a little bit more into that. You can do it. We believe you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I just started this um, speech pathology clinic all by myself with my husband and my daughter just a few months ago. I have worked in um, pediatric speech and language pathology for the last 20 years. Um, I was working at a local business that um, has OD, PT, speech, psych, all of it in one place in ABA and decided that I wanted to go out on my own and open something that was smaller, literally smaller, because that place was a little bit chaotic. So, um, and and I have to say it is more than I go there too. Yeah. So um, it is a small, calm clinic. 
it is designed for sensory sensitive individuals, especially those with autism, because that is my passion. I could not tell you how I got into that, but somehow the universe directed me into dealing with autism, um, and, and it's just become the thing that I've been most passionate about. Um, like I said, it is very sensory friendly. We've got different spaces. We are thinking about the lights. We're thinking about the sounds. We're thinking about people coming and going. I mean, even the proximity to the air handler has been an issue in our clinic because that's like, it's like you never know. Um, and that's me. I'm a chief SLP, and I've been doing this for quite a while. Okay. Oh, you don't see my hey, girl. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, so hopefully we can't miss this one. We do not know what a speaking language pathologist does. A lot of people just think that we correct arms or we help people with lists or we help people that stutter or something. It is way beyond that. Now I specialize in pediatrics. We specialize in swallowing disorders in um, aphasia with adults. If you've got a traumatic brain injury, anything that affects your communication or your feeding, believe it or not. That is something that we do. Um, specifically, and I know again, I'm so happy that Card touched on all of this stuff. One of the things that is my passion is the communication and the social aspects that happen here with autism. So, real quick, okay, doesn't like me tonight. What did you do? <laughs> Well, I mean, we can just bear it. Oh, you know what? For a few minutes. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> Try it. There you go. Okay. So, speech disorders. Now, these are things that are going to overlap with people that have any sort of developmental disability, not all the time. What this graph shows is the fact that there are several different reasons that a person may end up with unintelligible speech. In my experience, the thing that happens most with people on the autism spectrum is apraxia. So you're going to have a motor programming problem. So think about a golf swing. I know that I'm supposed to hit the ball and the ball is supposed to go over there. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm terrible at golf. So I might swing that golf club and I might connect with the ball the first time and it goes where I want it to go. The next time I might miss it completely. The time after that, the ball goes this way, the ball goes that way. I'm trying to hit one target, but I'm not getting there. And it's different every time. And so these individuals are the most difficult to understand. There are those kids where they have what we call a limited phoneme repertoire, where it's all P's, B's, M's, and B's, where you're just hearing everything. And you can't understand anything. They have a message that they're trying to send to you, but they can't motor coordinate to make that happen. Um, so this is one thing that speech pathologists do. And I, I, I um, specialize in apraxia. Johnny Depp, I don't know, I like my cute ducks. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that speech pathologists do are deal with language disorders. And again, this was touched on before, language deals with any method that you're going to communicate. Now, I wanna make this very clear. It's not just verbal communication. And I'm gonna touch on this in a minute. Most of us in this room probably speak to each other. That does not mean that that's the only way that people communicate. We know that sign language is a language. We know that people use um, pictures to communicate. I forgot my iPad, but we have people that use devices that have speech generating um, um, output, but it deals with your vocabulary. Reading and writing is also something that speech pathologists specialize in because it is just written language. We are still communicating with each other. I wish they would just call us communication specialists instead of speech language pathologists much better, but they don't. Um, grammar, that's why we got Yoda up there. Um, listening comprehension, that's where we were talking about your receptive and expressive language, the differences in my ability to give you a, a message and my ability to understand what you're communicating to me. And of course, the nonverbal uh, component comes into that. And you know what, I gotta remember what you said too. And I gotta remember what I'm trying to say to you. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes um, I can't remember what I was about to say because I'm thinking too much about it. Okay, so moving on to autism spectrum disorder, because that's why we're here. We're going to look at my, my specialty and what I have focused on in my life is overall communication skills. And this has so many different components. So those social skills and personal interaction, which are a little bit different. So my social skills might be something that has to do with the fact that I'm going to enter this room in a quiet manner while all these people are, you know, and we know the little kids don't 
<laughs> but we know adults that also don't understand that while someone's standing out here talking that socially they're not supposed to make a big bunch of noise when they walk into the room. Now, personal interaction is different. So that means if she and I are sitting here talking to each other, that I understand that we're going to take turns while we're talking. That um, things like sarcasm and, and joking and figurative language, it's raining cats and dogs does not mean that it's actually, you know, animals falling from the sky, that kind of thing. Um, AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. So this is when, and now unfortunately, no one knows why some people with autism don't speak. That I, I wish someone could figure that out. We don't know. But we do know that that doesn't mean that they don't have something to communicate. So what we're doing is we're giving them alternative means to communicate. So it might be that iPad, it might be pictures. Sign language goes a long way because we know that people are visual learners typically when they're on the autism spectrum. Giving them those visual components is huge. And I have seen children to this day, I'm working with a 12 year old who has attempted to say words but had not. And he can type out a paragraph to say to you on the address support recommendations about stuff like that later. Um, sensory processing. So that's another thing that we have to take into account. Um, again, I'm glad that I followed such a great presentation. You guys have already heard something about the fact that, I mean, fluorescent lights, um, like I said, the air conditioner, sirens, all of those things. I have literally started to become way too in tune to everything in my environment because I have to watch this child. And when they sit there and cover their ears and they start to have a meltdown, my first thought is, what did I just hear? or what just happened in this environment so that I can try to mitigate that so that they are going to be able to actually have an interaction with me that's gonna be more productive because I understand the things that are triggering their environment. And that goes into feeding too, but we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> um, the other thing that we really have to take into consideration are the family and caregiver expectations and wishes because this is very different between different families. I have had families that when kids are stimming, when they're doing that, and it is self-regulatory, they're doing that to calm themselves. Culturally, that family wants that extinguished. They do not want that child to rock. They do not want them to hand flat. They do not want them to script. It happens, trust me. And we, we educate as much as we can, but at the end of the day, my job is to make sure that I'm doing what this family is most comfortable with, right? Um, I contact. I have been to seminars and talked to people with autism who literally will tell you that eye contact makes them uncomfortable. Culturally, we expect eye contact. I know you're talking to me when you're looking at me. I know you're listening to me, you know, when you're looking at me. But some people with autism really don't want to deal with that. And so we try to make sure that we are understanding that those are things that the child is dealing with, but also taking into consideration what parents are dealing with in that same spot. So listening to all of those things is a big deal. Um, speech intelligibility. So, um, do you guys know what jargoning is? Yeah. So, you know, jargon, if you think about like medical jargon or, you know, if you're working in any kind of specialized area, there's so many words that are going to be used for specific things that we don't understand. Pipeline. Children do this too. Yeah. So, yes. Pipeline. So, it, it turns into, um, what we call proto words, words that sound like words that aren't words, you know, um, and they, we can't understand what they're they think that they're communicating with us, but we can't understand them. Um, apraxia is what I just was speaking about, um, where the motor programming isn't there, and then they're just scripting too. So I'm going to repeat everything I've ever heard off of Blue's Clues to you or off of that Cars movie or whatever. Now, the very interesting thing is that sometimes these things actually really do for the function. So a child might be quoting a movie and they're really trying to tell you something. And so then you get into that whole, like, what is it that you're trying to tell me? What, what scene from that movie are you associating with this particular, uh, you know, event in your life? Dr. Like, Bone is like, all right, it's a little fancy. But so it, it does, I know that some people don't appreciate the puzzle piece as a symbol for that, but it really is one of those things where we are just trying to figure out what is it that you're trying to tell me right now and how am I going to help you be more successful in your life as, as a learner, as a brother, as a son, and all that kind of stuff when you're communicating. Um, <clears throat> I could probably talk for 30 minutes about school placement and school expectations. Um, I also will attend IEP meetings 
and, and have a few times um, to make sure that the, because I worked my, in my beginning of my career, I worked in the schools for six years. And so I was that person that was sitting there at the table from the school perspective, knowing that, well, I know what we can provide as a school, and I know then, but the parent is expecting something else. So now my position can be to be that person in between what the school is able to provide and what the parent is trying to, to get accomplished. Um, and sometimes that can be tricky out of five. Most of the time, it's not that bad. Um, <clears throat> when you get to children that are very verbal and, you know, really good communicators, um, their academic performance is something that their parents are really concerned about. And typically these are kids that read well. They're great at math because math is very, math is very concrete, very good at concrete stuff. But then when they get into English language, you know, those ELA classes where there's a whole bunch of inferences and there's a whole bunch of figurative language, like I said, bring classes on that kind of stuff, they are struggling. And they need some very direct um, you know, assistance with that. I have the ability to assess those things. So I can literally do almost every assessment that a psychologist can do. Now, I can't diagnose some of the things that a, a psychologist can diagnose, but with the help of a team, I can diagnose autism. I would typically refer it out if there's a, but if somebody doesn't have access to that sort of thing, then they can come to a speech pathologist. And the assessment can also get you accommodations to school. Nothing that I can do is going to get you an IEP out of a school-based thing, but it can get you a 504 and if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, counseling parents and consultation, again, like talking to somebody about um, the services that they can expect in a school or what they can expect from an occupational therapist or from ADA or something like that. Those are things that I'm very well-versed in mentioned that already and then there's a lot of home programs there's a lot of additional resources there's websites there's all kinds of like card i mean we refer to card all the time because those are things that sometimes people don't necessarily know about that um you know and all of this is a team we just want what's best for the kids so even if your child isn't coming to me or your child isn't coming to me if i can find somebody that's going to be a great resource for you that's awesome okay take into consideration again one of the things that i'm going to do is decide, you know, how much do you know as a parent? How much am I going to educate you? What are you willing to learn? Some parents, I call them fix some parents. I'm sorry, but they're just like, here, you, you fix it. They don't, they don't want to come back in the sessions. They don't want to know. They just want you to fix it. And I really encourage parents to be in the sessions with us because we're going to have better outcomes when the parent is sitting right there. They've got the buy-in and they know what they're doing. Um, again, those expectations, like I was talking about with academics and eye contact, some parents don't want their children to, you know, but you might have heard the term ableism, they don't want their children to adapt to the world, they want the world to adapt to their children, and so um, you have to take all those things into consideration. Sensory sensitivity has been over already, um, however they're communicating right now, we're going to kind of capitalize on their strengths. Um, try to figure out their weaknesses so that they can communicate with everybody that they might need to during the day. Um, some people aren't able to get to a center. Some people do not have that transportation. Some people don't have the funds for that. So we can do um, home programs. And I have done, especially since COVID, a ton of stuff over Zoom. And that includes children that will not sit in front of a computer. I will coach a parent to interact with that child, even if the child will not sit in front of a computer. So. It's challenging, but it's possible. <laughs> um, and of course, there's also all of the ABA and the OT and PT and all those other psych and stuff that uh, they're doing. So there's there's things that I listen for when people are are, are coming to me. Um, I need to work on social skills. If this is the case, she's got no friends, you know, and that happens a lot where people are concerned. That there's a birthday party, no one's coming, that kind of thing. We're going to work on social skills. Um, Every time I go out in the public, you know, he's having a meltdown on the ground. I have no idea why. Okay, we're going to do some behavior analysis to figure that out. Um, somebody's scripting from a movie, and if the parent can't figure out, the teacher can't figure out what they're trying to say. So it's part of my job, too. And then there's also the frustrations. Um, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of schools that are not equipped, and the teacher education is about the same as the pediatricians from years ago. They don't know. And great teachers, they're going to find out. The others, you're going to have to go. But we can do that the friendly way. Um, I don't know how many parents I've had tell me that they can't go to restaurants. 
they can't go to Walmart, they can't do those things. So we're going to try to figure out ways that their child can communicate with them effectively so that they can then, you know, kind of resume daily activities. Um, yeah, and not understanding how health. Uh, I'll go through these really quickly. Assessment, intervention, um, coming up with a plan of care. We've got standing appointments, so it's regular. We want to see people as frequently as possible. We have the best outcomes are that way. Teletherapy is available, social groups, counseling, health programs. Um, and then, like I said, I will go to IEP meetings, 504 meetings, talk to teachers. Um, you can get accommodations for testing for that kind of stuff as well. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so just as a testimony here, I've used both CARD and um, Apple Tree Pediatric Therapy uh, Center. Um, my son is autistic, and both of the resources have been very helpful and amazing and very accommodating. Um, Kathy um, works at UF CARD and provides free um, visual supports, and so I've utilized that for parent support group. Uh, so a lot of good resources. Uh, we also have a lot of swag items over there. So when you guys are, when we're done with Q&As and the raffle, um, you guys can go up over there, talk, ask questions, um, and then pick up some, some items along the way. Um, okay, I know you guys are ready for the, the raffle winners. Okay, so the first raffle winner we have is actually um, on Zoom. It is Keisha Lamar, Lamari. Are you ready this? into the raffle. Huh? Was, so I uh, we just I took down names um, and then I have a, a Keisha. Can you hear me? You're a winner. <laughs> okay, and then hear me. And then the next winner we have is Tiffany Noble. No. <laughs> um, and then our last winner is Jen Gann. Is that how you? Jen. Okay, well, I switched. Uh, I selected an extra just in case. Um, Tiffany Danielle Pineda. Of course. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, what is um, So we'll turn to you by raffle with these milk and items from Florida uh, museums and just little trinkets and whatnot. So thank you guys for coming and to address let, me, you have, let me go ahead and do QAs. I see one in the chat. Were there any more questions from Zoom? I only see one question in the chat. No, just the one question. You want to read that one off? Sure. What is the process for getting an evaluation? Does it require a doctor's referral and is there a waiting list? Is this to, for UF card or? This was for UF card, I believe. Okay. Can I add an exception to that? Is the is the process different for adults and children? Okay. Yeah, so, so actually the process is not that different, um, meaning that you almost always have to have a referral, but the referral can come from a lot of different people. So because this is there are academics components to this, as well as social, as well as sometimes motor, certainly speech and behavioral components, um, it's not uncommon for people to get a referral <laughs> from their pediatrician, but really any professional who is working with that child or adult can can make a referral for the evaluation. Yes, you can expect there to be waiting lists. Um, one of the things we do keep on our database is a list of professionals who provide diagnostic service. And again, we'll give you that list and then you can call and find out. You can expect to hear that there's going to be a, a waiting list. And you can say, please put me on that waiting list. You can also say, please put me on your cancellation list. Then you can be a little bit of a squeaky wheel and call every once in a while and say, hey, any room for my kid? That's kind of how it happens. Um, there are not a lot of people in the field who are properly trained in the, the tools that are specific to diagnosing autism. So you want to make sure you have a person who is properly trained in those diagnostic tools. And that can be, again, any member of a lot of different types of professions. Um, for adults, you can self-refer. Some people will accept a self-referral, um, especially because there are um, some screening tools online available for free that people will fill out. Um, and you can call the, let's say, the psychiatrist or the, uh, or the clinical psychologist and say, I have this, is this enough? Most of the time they will say no, in which case you take those, those um, tools that you have filled out, those questionnaires and such, bring it to any provider that you already have and have them directly refer you. 
Again, expect there to be waiting lists. There are definitely a shorter number of people on the list who are comfortable diagnosing adults um, because the, the tools in some ways are the same, but because you're looking at the person's whole history and not just a couple of years of life, um, some people don't choose to, to and will refer out if, they're, if it's an adult they're being asked to evaluate. So the list is shorter. For those people who will be willing to evaluate adults. And we have a how step. early can it be diagnosed? My son is two and a half and has been working with early steps for the past year. So good job getting early steps involved. That's awesome. As you probably already know, Jacqueline, you're, you're, you can only benefit from early steps until your child turns three. Um, so great job for taking advantage of that. Sometimes people don't find out about early steps until their child is two and a half and then they, they kind of miss that boat, which is unfortunate. The answer to your question is that um, it's there's some controversy about how old the child has to be. Because there's no blood test or brain scan or anything like that, we're looking at behavioral excesses and deficits, meaning things that your child should be doing but is not doing, and things that your child should not do and be doing that he or she is doing. The average age of diagnosis in the United States is four and a half years old. So you are not behind in any way by any means. Certainly feedback from your early steps professional um, will help guide you towards whether or not that's an appropriate next step for you. There are some professionals who believe that kids can be diagnosed between one year and 18 months old. Um, that really depends. You know, if you're looking for certain social behaviors to not be present that should be present, the child has to be old enough for that to be age appropriate, right? So you don't expect a one-year-old child to know how to share or reciprocate, you know, gestures, for example. You look there, I look there. But by the time the child is two or two and a half, you do expect those kinds of behaviors. So there are certain things that we're looking for that would not be present in a child that is one, one and a half, maybe even two. Um, but depending on the tools that are used, we do have toddler level evaluation uh, diagnostic tools. So 18 months is, is a safe bet. Um, but in this country, it's, it's four and a half years old is the average. So yeah, cool. evidence timing for the back and say, please call your insurance provider because some insurance providers will not cover an ADOT done by an SLP, done by an LT, done by an MD. It has to be done by a PhD or someone very specific according to your insurance. Yes. And as we all know, all insurances are different. And so call and ask. Do you get on the waiting list ask? The day before your test, call and ask because those things change in between those times. I usually I usually tell people, you know, even when you have everything set up, you still want to double check. So that yeah. comment was about, you weren't able to hear what Meg said. That comment was about insurance. It's definitely true that all insurance companies have not only have different rules about how they will fund things, but also who they will fund them by. So even a PhD, you it has to be a certain kind, you know. So, you know, it will depend, it's it's per insurance company and they all kind of have different rules about that. The prime question to ask is, who does the test need to be done by in order to receive services? And what tests do you require? Yes. Because there are different tests. So uh, one of the most common or well-known tests for autism is the ADOS, but it is not the only one. Um, there are also, they also want tests of cognition. They also want tests of, of other things to kind of round out services you might be requesting. Mm -hmm. So there's getting your diagnosis, the tests required for diagnosis, and then there's tests required for services, and each insurance company requires different ones. So it's important to say, do you take, ask the provider, do you take my insurance? It's important to ask the insurance company, what exactly do I need? Send me a list of exactly what I need so that I can get my kid diagnosed in a way that you will cover them. Do we have any more questions here? Is it Early Steps part of CARD? It is not. Early Steps is a different organization, and their job is to work with kids birth through three. So before they enter the school system, technically, you don't have to put your kid at school, in school at three, but many, but you can. School services are available at the age of three. And so we often see kids transitioning from a place like Early Steps, or I should say an organization like Early Steps, right into the school system for preschool. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, at that point, some of their challenges, whether they're behavioral or social or language or whatever, will have already been identified. So in order to qualify for early steps, you have to have a delay already acknowledged. Another thing to point out is that um, pediatricians are supposed to be doing well checks that include developmental screenings. So when you go to your pediatrician, 18, 24, and 36 months, you're supposed to get, no, 12, 24, 12, 18, and 24 months, you're supposed to get this kind of screening tool so that if there are areas of delay, 
Maybe it's just language, maybe it's just motor, or maybe it's a bunch of things. They're, they're identifying those from very early on. And then they see them at 12 months, you come back at 18 months, they'll do the same assessment again, see if improvements have been made so that they can start guiding you towards things like early steps. To be that squeaky wheel too, like she was saying, even with your pediatrician, yes. because I've seen so many are like lately, oh, we're just gonna wait and see, we're gonna wait and see, we're gonna wait and see. And the parent is saying, I know there's something going on and the pediatrician's not giving the referral, not giving the referral. Push the pediatrician yeah. if you really think they're- Get a new one. Yeah, get a new one. That's it right yeah, that too. I'm trying to tell you yeah. that yeah. No, no. Yeah, there, there it is. And that's also one of the things that insurance stuff with the referrals. Some insurances require referrals, some don't. If you're going to pay out of pocket, then you, you know, you don't have to have that if you're direct access to a provider. Um, it all depends on some places have sliding you. scales. Feel free to ask about sliding scales. There may be the component of that whatever you're required to pay that you need a sliding scale for. Some providers will do that. So it's 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 always good to ask. The worst they can say is no. Yes. How closely does the um, DCF work with CAR to refer children who are in the system. So, do you diagnose them so that Dr. Lizzo, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> so, it can happen both ways. So, it can happen the family makes the referral themselves to CAR, but often it's the, it's the DCF professional who is made aware of a family who is in need of those services. And I'm going to pass this over to Meg, my colleague, who also works for CAR. Because this is one of her specialty areas, sure. working with DCF. Yeah. Got to hold this in there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So the answer is kind of complex because um, families come to DCF for many reasons, right? And through many avenues. So oftentimes um, in the DCF system, we have this big gap in which if a child was nonverbal, if a child was exhibiting odd social behaviors, they were just considered unable to interview, unable to interact, and it was just left at that. Now, in all of Circuit 8, every DCF investigator, every caseworker, everybody that gets trained by partnership and kinship um, gets training from CARD, for me, by CARD. And so they know what those warning signs look like. They know who to refer to. They know those things. If a child has autism or suspected autism um, on their list when they come up for a case conference, myself or someone else from CAR attends their case conference. And so we are getting resources all along the way. And I think the awareness for the DCF staff is particularly important because autism can look, look a lot like trauma. And yeah. being a DCF family, by definition, you probably have experienced some trauma, right, in, in that world, but for whatever reason, a number of reasons. And so part of it is you know, what are we looking at here? What does this really mean? And how, how are the DCF team and CARD and any other agencies that are typically involved, it's usually a big group of people. How are we all going to, you know, stake claim on in these things to make sure that the kid can communicate their needs, that they're feeling safe, um, and all of those things can be related both to the diagnosis of autism and trauma. Mm -hmm. And then the great news is the strategies that work for kids that have encountered trauma and the strategies for kids that have autism or kids that fall in both categories or adults that fall in both categories are the same strategy, right? So like using the visual supports, working on children's strength, approaching from a trauma-based approach, being aware that trauma is existent and that those behaviors might look weird because trauma comes out in all sorts of weird ways, right? Um, so we do tons of training on behavior and what that may or may not or a million other options could look like. Um, so if you are involved with an agency, I would love to train you. Well, no, my, my daughter <laughs> son, and my son was just adopted from children who exhibit uh, both trauma. So and let me stick your foot in your personal business and say, sure. um, I'm doing a really great project with some law students at the University of Florida and Partnerships for Strong Families that works on um, that transition into foster care, that transition into adoption, that transition into transitions that um, kids in the system often go through quite a bit and offering one-to-one -one support 